Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Today I'm going to circle around and pick up a story a number of you wanted me to cover last week and that is uh, that the Queen of the Tearling has been set up at Warner Brothers with Emma Watson in the lead. A and they had a very tantling uh, description. They said it's a Game of Thrones kind of uh, uh, adventure film about a, with a teenage heroine, and it's going to be played by Emma Watson. And I really like Emma Watson. I think she's really awesome. But uh, when you delve a little further into what's going on here, uh, I, I wouldn't hold my breath for this project to, to, to come to fruition and to some degree to be successful. Why? Okay, here are my concerns. First off, Emma Watson is tied to a lot of stuff. She's still tied to that Guillermo del Toro Beauty and the Beast. So just because a deal is signed doesn't mean it's being fast-tracked. Uh, second of all, David Heyman uh, is the going to produce it, and he's producing also for Warner Brothers, and he produced the Harry Potter franchise, which is like, you know, how, how Emma Watson obviously got the inside track, and how they had the inside track on arguably one of the hottest up-and-coming talents in Hollywood, largely thanks to the smart choices she's been making post-Potter. Uh, but at the same time, you'll remember that I reported that Heyman is also developing a Fables franchise for Warner Brothers, and this looks like a very heavy slate. Now, maybe he can multitask, a la Jerry Bruckheimer, and get all this stuff off the ground. But remember, when he made Harry Potter, he was really only focusing on Harry Potter. Uh, and, and he's currently trying to get Paddington Bear off the ground. I think they're, they're about to cast that. So I think that David Heyman has a lot of, you know, irons in the fire, but we'll see which one he pulls out first. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that they say Game of Thrones, but when I read the description, it, it's not a medieval kind of movie. This isn't going to be like her, her answer to Kristen Stewart's Snow White and the Huntsman for Emma Watson. This is, they said it takes place in the future, uh, and it's an apocalyptic future that seems to have some elements of Alice in Wonderland mixed in there. Uh, and so you're really actually getting more of an I Am Legend, Book of Eli kind of uh, film. Now, I Am Legend was very successful, despite a lot of people disliking it uh, when they left the theater. But they all paid to go and see it, so haha. -ha. But um, I think apocalyptic films, post-apocalyptic movies, are very hard to pull off and to sell to audiences. So we'll see what they develop. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't totally hold out hope on this, but uh, I think that Game of Thrones is a little bit misleading for, for a hook, and I feel, but I do like Emma Watson a lot, and I hope, it, she does make, as I said, she makes smart choices, so she must, there must be something about this project that is compelling and sets it apart from, uh, I'm sure, the other similar but mindless uh, big blockbuster roles she's being offered. Uh, okay, so that's the first, that's the first story of the day. The second story is uh, pretty interesting. You know, I, I, there's a director that I underlined for you, J.A. Bayona, when The Impossible came out uh, around the holiday season. His film, you know, Naomi Watts got nominated for an Oscar and for a Golden Globe, uh, she, but the film overall was really fantastic. And I th said, someone's going to snap this guy up. He is such a talented director. He directed The Orphanage, the Spanish language film, which horror film, which I really highly recommend to you, that you go out and you go and uh, stream or rent if you can. But uh, someone did pick him up, and it was television. Uh, we're losing directors to TV, but you know, obviously they can do both. And he's teaming up, he's been tapped by none other than Sam Mendes, which is fantastic. Sam Mendes is uh, re-teaming with his Skyfall writer, John Logan, to bring a Victorian Gothic horror uh, show to Showtime called Penny Dreadful. And uh, I have to say, I don't know how this is going to do because some of the BBC uh, the, like for instance, BBC's Copper hasn't really caught on here. And, I mean, this is a tough time period uh, to, to sell to audiences from hell. But from hell, that movie with Johnny Depp based on the Alan Moore, that wasn't particularly... It was, from what I, I read the novel afterwards, it wasn't a particularly strong adaptation. But anyway, I feel like on Showtime, and with this kind of talent attached, Sam Mendes, John Logan, and J.A. Bayona, uh, I guess they're going to maybe take turns directing or something like that, or J.A. Bayona will maybe take over Mendes for, uh, for Mendes after the pilot. It would be really awesome if we could get something that is on the level of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. The, and I'm not talking about that horrible movie, but if you haven't read it, and you have to be an adult to read this, okay? <laughs> but if you haven't read Alan Moore, Alan Moore's particularly fantastic series, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, it kind of goes off the rails toward the end, but the, the, at least pick up the first two graphic novels. Really amazing stellar work. So, I mean, and we all know the Victorian era can get pretty naughty. So if Showtime can kind of not, not go too far, but kind of have a great mix of that, I think they could have a big hit on their hands. I, I even like the title, Penny Dreadful. And I think J.A. Bayona and Sam Mendes are obviously fantastic talents. I'm a little disappointed that J.A. Bayona hasn't been picked to do a movie uh, for one of the big studios. You know, I said a comic book movie should, I mean, this talent, you gotta you got snap it up. But I, th I think he's, he's really extraordinarily a talented director and a real win for Showtime. If Showtime could get a 
prestigious show. I mean, they have a lot of prestigious shows right, right now, but I'm talking about one that has like a really lavish set production and budget, kind of like HBO does. You know, with Deadwood and Boardwalk Empire uh, and Game of Thrones, obviously, where they create these worlds. So if Showtime can get in on that, that's going to be really exciting for them. So I, I'm very interested in seeing how this develops, and I would watch it. Uh, the third story is like a fun kind of a fun side note. Uh, of course, what, what well, how could a day go by without some comic book movie news? And this is a fun story. Uh, you know how all the set pictures that have been leaking for Captain America because they're shooting in Cleveland? Uh, the Captain America producers in Marvel Studios are getting very nervous to the extent of the photographs that are being leaked. So they actually have a PA standing on the set with a giant poster that says, No pictures, please. Uh, kind of trying to appeal to your, your sense of morality, which I think is ridiculous. Uh, if these movies don't want spoilers, they should shoot on a closed set. I mean, movie studios have huge backlots for this reason, per, uh, you know, exactly. And, uh, you know, I think, I think you're only going to encourage people to take more pictures. And also, this is a movie that's going to make you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and make hundreds of millions of dollars for the people involved. And the photograph, the photographs off of said film are worth a lot, uh, you know, a lot of money. So I, I, I think it's a little bit interesting that they would be like, hey, you know, we're going to make a lot of money off of this, but don't you make any money off of this, even though we're out in the open and you, you have every right to stand here and take the photo. So, I mean, but this is a little bit of a problem for movies. I can see where they're coming from. I mean, the, the Talia twist in The Dark Knight Rises was infamously spoiled by a photograph being taken on a set when everyone was like, she's dressed a lot like Rachel Ghoul. Hmm. So, uh, but you know, it's the movie studio's responsibility to, to, to have this kind of secrecy and they need to either shoot at night or really close down the streets or shoot on a movie set. So, but I, although I will say, I would like to add, these pictures are making me a lot more excited for the movie. So I think that Marvel shouldn't be against them getting out there. I really love the like kind of 70s political thriller vibe that they kind of have to them. I love see I, I really like Black Widow, so I like seeing more of her. I think Winter Soldier looks fantastic, and they t took a sequel that I didn't have high hopes for because I felt that the first film was basically two very long mon uh, montages and uh, made me really excited for. It. I'm really I can't wait. So, you know, just let the dice roll, uh, Marvel. I think that this isn't a disaster. Uh, so speaking of, you know, uh, allegiances with movies and, you know, directors like Jay Bayona saying someone should snap him up at Mar uh, for the Marvel or DC movies. Yesterday, one of you asked me, uh, are Marvel and DC aware of the Marvel-DC rivalry or is this just something that the fans have made up? Uh, I can't speak to the film level, but I doubt you would see an actor appear in either in both uh, worlds. Uh, but so I can't speak to how the film studios uh, feel, the film divisions, although I would imagine it is probably an extension of the comic book companies, where I actually know a number of people at both Marvel and DC. I actually had coffee with some, uh, someone from DC uh, like about a week ago. And I'll tell you that they are very aware of this rivalry. It is an, a real thing. Now, this is not to say they're not civil to each other when they see each other at comic book conventions. And you might even find some people who are from different teams, you know, secretly or quietly at least, you know, not making a big deal about it, sharing a drink at a bar at a convention or something like that, or even in the city. But uh, the main executives take it very seriously. You will, you, and they, they take pot shots at each other uh, during interviews, both on and off camera. Uh, and you'll notice that you, if you are a freelancer, even if you, you know, if you have an exclusive, obviously you only work for one. But for the most part, you got to pick a team. You really, you cannot work for Marvel and DC at the same time. Uh, and when you work for the other one, you just can't go, you know, they will not consider you at the other publisher. And that's why you will probably never see another Marvel and DC team up ever again. <laughs> uh, do I, I mean, I don't know. I think that they are just such, they're just in such a heated locked competition that I can understand the kind of rivalry because their, their books do compete so heavily. And, you know, it's like they're competing for the same reader. So, obviously, that's a, it's a sore point. But I would maybe think that considering some of the, as I talked about in movie math yesterday, there's just such hate and anger that's being, that's being even, you know, made even bigger by the movies at this point that perhaps maybe, they, you know, they should have like a little, uh, you know, peace summit between Marvel and DC to kind of be like, you know what, you can like both guys. You know, both of us have our wins and both of us have our losses. Let's just enjoy comic books and comic book-based properties and uh, be able to talk about them openly without fear of harassment. So, uh, so, so write your thoughts down below. Uh, and also, you know what? It's probably against my better judgment, but I just have to, to address it. A number of people yesterday said, well, Grace, uh, 
how can you say that it's split evenly on A Man of Steel, liking and disliking? Everyone I personally know loves it, and what about that 82% audience approval over on Rotten Tomatoes? Now, I would say to you, Rotten Tomatoes, the critic rating, takes into account and goes and finds all the major critics and, you know, the second-tier critics and sometimes even the third-tier critics. That's why they have a top critic section. And they, uh, so they, that's really, they actively go and get everybody. The, the website does. And that's why I think that the, the critical rating, the Rotten Tomatoes score, is trusted by a lot of people and why it has some merit. Now, that audience number is by people who go and sign on to Rotten Tomatoes voluntarily and rate the film. Uh, which is usually t tends to be, you know, hardcore fans. So that's not an accurate rating. And I would also tell you that even though all the people you might personally know love the film, I mean, they are, they're similar to you. They have a like mind. If you go through the comments, there are people admitting in, you know, the videos that they didn't like Man of Steel or they had problems with it at least. Uh, as I'm going to talk about later this week, Mark Wade, who wrote Superman Birthright, which uh, a large part of Man of Steel is based on, came out over the weekend and said he really ended up, like, hating the film. He came out very strongly against it. Uh, you know, I saw a lot of comic book writers saying they didn't like it. I saw a lot of comic writers saying they did like it. Uh, and some people said, oh, well, follow the Twitter feeds and you'll only see positive things. You know, that's who you're following. Uh, you know, and it's just, and also I have to tell you, a lot of people are privately sending me uh, emails because they don't want to deal with the, the angry people in the comment section, but they're saying, oh, just so you know, I agree with you. And uh, you'll see that I, I just, it's, it's a really sore point. I said it was evenly split. Uh, people, a lot of people like it, but a lot of people aren't crazy about it. And I think that, you know, and I said that was my guess. And we'll, you know what, you, we'll know next weekend. This will have a definitive answer when we see how much the movie drops. Uh, and I'm going to have the strength to admit what, if I'm wrong and it does hold up well, and I'll be like, yay, yay, DC Cinematic Universe, I want to see it as much as you do. But I'll ask you, if the movie does drop next weekend, are you going to be able to admit that maybe not everyone's in, as in love with it as you are? So uh, write down below what you think on that as well, and if you and if you don't like, you know, Man of Steel, I don't, I don't know what to advise you on. I mean, it's pretty brutal in here, so I don't know if you want to get in here or not, but, uh, I'm, you know, let's just all take a breather. We only have to wait a week, and then we'll have a very definitive answer that I think is, uh, you know, that you really can't argue with. All right. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'll t see you tomorrow, and I'll see you later today with more videos, and, uh, you know, I'll see you online. Bye.